Okay. Hey everyone, I want to want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Tonight we're going to talk about launching Node.js from scratch. Uh, I see you know a bunch of new faces here tonight, and some people who who've been kind of with us from the early days. Uh, it's kind of an exciting night because uh, we're we're going to both be celebrating. Uh, I guess this year's the fourth uh, birthday of Node.js, and it also happens to be the uh, 1500 mark we just passed uh, for the group, so the meetups reach 1500. So I've got some cake. Uh, don't rush off after our last uh, speaker. We've got a really awesome cake. Come all the way from Los Gatos, uh, fr from a uh, top a top tier place. So uh, it, it'll be some fun. We'll take you know everyone get pictures, tweet it out or whatever. Uh, I'm excited tonight because uh, we've had this request for this topic many times, which is um, kind of presenting uh, some. S stories, from, you know, real world stories about people who have taken Node from, you know, A to Z uh, from scratch and and rolled it out uh, into production. Uh, we're going to see this topic come up again, probably a lot more as more enterprises are jumping in. And I'm going to segue that over uh, to Matt here to talk yeah. about. Strongly. You can keep that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Already we'll use that for Q and A later. Right. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, yeah, this is actually really exciting for uh, I think everybody. Node is only four years old, which is kind of remarkable. But um, oh, actually, there's one thing I need to do. Two of the guys who work on uh, Node.js core are part of the Strong Loop team, and they're in Amsterdam. So I'm gonna open a Heineken in their honor. You're welcome, Bert and Ben. I like your style. Thank you. Whoever said that. Come Come talk to me. Yeah, I can't even think straight. Um, OK, so uh, I'm really happy to be here. I haven't been out and about in a while uh, doing the meetup scene. I used to work for Cloud9 IDE. And uh, we spun off some people from that company into a new company called Strongloop. And um, today I'm going to talk about how we built the website um, from start to finish in Node.js. and. Uh, first, though, <clears throat> what I do at Strong Loop is we're a startup and there's only about seven people, so I do pretty much everything like everybody else in the company does. And uh, what we're doing at Strong Loop is we saw this need for um, professional support, consulting, and training services that really isn't out there right now. And, uh, and then also, we're going to take our expertise building Node and what people really want to do with Node, and we're going to build some products, which I'll talk about later. You guys have some questions about that. Okay, um, so actually, another note: I really wanted to make this a different type of presentation, and I'm going to continue working on this idea. But um, I really want to make a Node workshop where you, the audience, actually codes along with me. And the idea is that you go to a website and you can see the presentation that I'm going through, and there's prompts for you to code. So there might be some oddities in the presentation because I didn't finish the back end of this. Um, so just keep that in mind. There might be some like hints for you guys to actually do something, but you're not going to do anything. Right. We're creating a website, and we need a web server. Obviously, that's what you need. Um, how many of you have heard of Express? Okay. How many of you have actually coded an Express application? Or okay. So you guys are all familiar with this, or most of you are. Um, but just to hammer the point, there's two options. There's to use the default HTTP library that comes with Node. Uh, but what Express does is it takes that library and builds some interface functionality on top of it. So it handles all of the nitty gritty details about you know, um, route handling and static assets and session handling and logging and pretty much everything that you would want to do with a web server. It takes that to a really high level, makes it really easy to get started. So it's a much easier choice to go with Express than to try to build all this stuff in HTTP yourself. Um, so this is an Express application. If you install Express with NPM and you just run Express My App and, uh, and install the dependencies and then run it, this is what you get, really. It's actually uh, pretty remarkable how many lines of code this is. This is 30 lines of code. And if it's not obvious already, this is the really great thing about Node.js is you actually have the code for your web server. It's not like Apache or another system. The code is actually there, and you can modify it to your whim. So what we want to do is really build on just the basic component of 
a web server and take that to the next level. Because a website is more than just a web server. And typically, uh, for instance, at a website like Strongloop, you have a bunch of different pages, but you probably also have a, a bunch of different functionality. And I'll go into that a little bit. Um, so <clears throat> when I was at Cloud9, we had some, we had a pretty extensive code base. It was about 400,000 lines of code on the back end. And uh, as you can imagine, 20 developers working on 400,000 lines of code, it gets a little messy. So we needed some way to put, introduce structure into the code base. And what, how many of you know who Tim Caswell is? CreationX on Twitter, maybe? Okay, David knows. <laughs> Tim is a really smart guy, and he worked with uh, the creator of the Ace Editor. How many of you have heard of the Ace Editor? That's the code editor that we use at Cloud9. Okay. Um, and Sergi Mencia and this other developer, Christoph Dorn, and they developed this really simple, this really elegant, and really great, uh, I would call it a framework. It's kind of just a, a way to introduce structure into your Node.js applications. And they called it Architect. Um, so Architect is a simple but powerful structure for Node.js applications. Using Architect, you set up a simple configuration file that tells Architect which plugins to load. That's literally all it does. There's a configuration file and some plugins. And it's not like what you might think of as a traditional plugin. It's more like, um, it's more like a module system, but calling it a module system is kind of confusing. So uh, I'll show you guys what this means. Okay. So this is uh, the plugins folder for Strongloop. It's only one, two, three, four, five, six plugins. Uh, what you see down here at the bottom is the Strongloop plugin is kind of the entry point for the application. And all these other plugins are interacting with each other to achieve different pieces of functionality. So as your application grows, so does your list of plugins so that you can kind of keep these things separate and clean and neat and easy to scale. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to take Express, the Express code that we just generated a little bit ago, and put it into an Architect plugin. So what are some of the things that we want to do uh, if you're going to implement uh, Express as a plugin? Well, you want to do the things that Express does really well, like set up static routes, set up standard post get, et cetera, routes, and enable a 404 page, and maybe some authentication or logging details that you want to set up. And uh, the goal in doing all this is, is that you want to make it so that it's a self-contained plugin, but you also need to provide an interface for other plugins to use it by. So this is what an architect plugin looks like. First, we have the, uh, the setup function, which architect understands to call when your plugin is being invoked. And it comes with three parameters I'll talk about in a little bit. One of them is called register. And so you have all of the express code that we generated previously, right here. And then you'll have the register function to actually expose the HTTP server, the express server, to anyone else who wants to consume this plugin, right? So you want to have some functionality like I just talked about. So uh, register a route, that would be like a get or a post, and you provide a URL. And then uh, a static route, so if you have like CSS and JavaScript and images and so on and so forth, you want to add a static route. And then maybe a function for enabling a 404 page. So what does it look like when we inject that express code in? We literally just put it right in the middle of that, the heart of the, the setup function. And then uh, Let's just look, for instance, real quick at when you want to add a static route, then you call app.use express.static and then the route. So if you are, um, so sorry, app is the express server that we created earlier. So really the register function is just a matter of interacting with the code that already exists in the setup function and exposing that to the rest of the world. So the brilliance of this approach, and the reason why it worked so well for Cloud9, and it should work so well for you guys, is that uh, it's reusable. This module approach is, uh, is if you can uh, build your plugin in such a way, and, and this is really what it, the kind of structure that it enforces, 
uh, you can take those plugins and plop them in anywhere with any other future application that you create. Here's another plugin that we created. Um, this is SendGrid. How many of you have heard of SendGrid? It's an email service. Okay. Man, I'm sweating over here. It is hot in here. Um, <clears throat> so what I really wanted with designing this plugin for sending it, this is for when you want to send an email to um, one of our developers and you uh, are issuing a support request, which we have on our website. And so I designed the plugin so really you can just take this plugin and you can plop it into any Node.js application and then just invoke the send email function from any other plugin. And it like does what it, your credentials are. I'll get, I'll get into how it knows those credentials. Um, but it'll just send the email and it'll use the SendGrid service and everything is beautiful. And you, this is only like 20 lines of code and you can take that and put it anywhere in, in a future Node.js application. Um, so does the philosophy of how Architect works kind of make sense? Like it's trying to separate different pieces of functionality into plugins? So, how is this actually used from another plugin? So this is the code from our primary plugin called Strong Loop. And what happens is um, Architect exposes all the different plugins that you want to consume via the imports variable. So we have options, imports, and register. We already know what register does. Imports.sendgrid is the interface to the SendGrid plugin. And so when somebody is sending us a support request via a post from you know, just our homepage, we do some checking, make sure everything is okay and there's no, nothing nefarious going on. And then we call sendgrid.sendemail and then we just provide the details that we have formulated from that. Really clean, really elegant, just a really nice way to do your application. Okay, so how does uh, architect know what to load and what kind of options should it be passing to your plugins. This is where your configuration folder is, uh, comes into play. And so what it is really is just an array of all the different plugin paths and all the different variable options that you want to pass to your plugin. So for instance, <clears throat> we have the HTTP server plugin and we want to tell it uh, to start up on port 8888 and with the IP address 0.0.0, .0 and then pass it this primary URL. Then we have another plugin, the Strong Loop plugin, and the Jira plugin, and the SendGrid plugin. And uh, so this is where the options come into play that I referenced earlier. So um, options.user and options.key, those come from the configuration file that I just showed options.user, options.key. And so if you have a SendGrid API, this is where you would put that information. And uh, this happens to be the develop, the devel.js version of uh, the configuration uh, setup that we have. But then we also have the deploy version, which uses uh, a different IP address and port because we host it on Heroku, which I'll talk about in a second. And then, um, so the way I figure out if we're going to be running uh, the devel version or the deploy version is I find out if there's a process.env.port, which is an environment variable that Heroku sets. And um, if there is that environment variable, then I just say the configuration file should be deploy.js. And then that's how you can have those two different types of environments. OK. Um, so I kind of just already went through this. So this is just another way of looking at in our uh, HTTP server plugin. Obviously, we've passed it the options.port and options.ip variables. And uh, that's how we know which port and IP address to start the server on. OK, so uh, we built this application. It works really great locally, and everything's fine. And now you're trying to consider which hosting provider to use. And uh, having been at Cloud9 for a long time, working with a lot of different PaaS providers, unfortunately, I don't know Engineer that well, so I apologize in advance that I didn't really consider them. But um, this was something that was very easy for us to make a, um, a kind of philosophical decision on. Since we don't really have an advanced backend, and we're not really getting that much traffic because we're a new company, we don't really need 
the uh, most advanced, flexible, uh, sophisticated backend. And so I really, really want to stress this point, and you'll understand why. Avoid making it harder on yourself to maintain your website. If it's not part of your core business to just have a website up, or really most of the time just to having an application up, do not go through the effort to set up anything else that you don't need. And that is, generally speaking, AWS. Everybody wants to be on AWS. Why? Because it's powerful. But <clears throat> this is what we experienced at Cloud9. And we had to use AWS because Cloud9 was servicing you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And it was massively complicated. And we wanted to make sure we weren't going down in one zone and all this stuff. But in terms of choosing the technology that will get you to achieve your business goals, do not choose anything that will waste your time. And you will waste your time, I can almost guarantee it, if you are comparing it to a $33 dyno on Heroku to just scale your website a little bit, you will, I can guarantee you, you will spend that and 10 times that amount at least just trying to fix little tiny bugs on AWS, making sure your website is up. Just don't even worry about it. Don't even go there. So if you don't need to have that complex of an infrastructure, choose something that is built to do what you need. A pass provider like Engine Yard or Heroku or whatever is what you need. OK, so transitioning away from that, um, what you saw earlier was uh, the use of some NPM modules like uh, SendGrid and uh, meetup.com's API. Um, and what's great and fantastic and incredible about NPM is that there are now probably something like 22,000 user land modules out there that can do just about everything you would ever want to do. And if you can't, then it's really easy to just integrate those and build on top. Um, so just I wanted to do some things, like I wanted to integrate with JIRA so that we could send support requests to JIRA. I also wanted to <coughs> integrate with meetup.com and also um, and use SendGrid. And so SendGrid had already created an NPM module to interface with their service. And uh, you guys saw how crazy simple that code was. That was like six lines of code. And then the meetup.com API implementation and um, Node.js already existed. So these are modules that everybody's just creating, putting out there for free, and feel free to use them on your website. You know, NPM really is an incredible thing. Um, <coughs> so this is just a, a matter of experience. Um, I was trying to think of all the caveats that I, that I you know, or the, all the roadblocks that I got um, that came about from building this. And, and really, um, to be frank, there only took a few days to do the back end. Uh, that might be surprising, but working at Cloud9, we rewrote everything about 2,000 times. So um, The other 27 days for that month period were really spent on designing the content uh, and doing graphics and design. This goes back to what I said earlier. If you're building on AWS, you're going to be spending a lot more time on dev, dev op stuff. If that's not your core competency, don't even worry about it. You can spend a lot more time doing the stuff that matters for your business. And generally speaking, that's graphics design, that's content design, things like that. Um, and yeah, so on the front end, uh, I know this is about Node, but on the front end, we use Bootstrap and jQuery. And I have no problem with using that stuff. I think it's great for providing structure for your site and for providing front-end JavaScript functionality. Brilliant. Um, yeah, and that's it. I think I zoomed right through that. Yeah. So what was the strategy? I saw that you were injecting the, uh, some of the assets and then others you were mentioning uh, as links in the, in the Jade template. Yeah. Um, so the question is, what is the strategy there? Um, typically, you have a set of common functionality. Uh, this is a good example, jQuery.scroll2. If I go to the website here, um, oh yeah, this is our products page that is coming up. I better just go to the non-developed version. Um, so when you click on uh, you know, what we do, it scrolls down to what we do. And that functionality also exists on the community page. Um, and it just scrolls down. So I figured, well, I use it in a couple places. I might as well just put it in the main header file. I don't need to, but it keeps the other code a little bit cleaner. I don't have to keep repeating myself. This is, by the way, the um, integration with the meetup.com API. 
Um, what this does is it pulls in all of the active Node.js meetups that are upcoming with, that are geotagged, and then it just plots them on a map. So that's, that's kind of fun. Like, you know, what's fun about it for me is they're all hexagons, so they're all just like <laughs> getting plotted there. Okay, yeah, so um, uh, Node.js specifically, uh, I think it was Ryan Dahl's original dream, this is what I heard, was to create a really nice, elegant cluster API. So you could run node processes on different servers and have a really robust communication mechanism between them. You can do that currently with the cluster module, um, but it's, you know, it's still a work in progress. Like, like I said, Bert and Ben are on the core Node.js team and they're also part of Strongloop. And so one of our intentions is to uh, be more vocal about where Node.js can improve a lot. And the cluster API is one of those areas. File system performance is one of them. Uh, memory management is actually still really bad if you're running on a, like a 512 megabyte VM on you know, some hosting provider. You're not gonna be able to spawn a lot of Node.js processes before you really run out of memory. Uh, I think probably like 40 processes probably, which is not a lot. Um, and that's just a baseline standard. So um, there's a lot of areas where Node.js can definitely improve. Why is that? Why is, why is the uh, in order for V8 to be really, really fast, what it does is if you have like a, a buffer of you know, string data, it'll create a really big buffer. And um, that's just the reason. And then uh, there's not a lot of, I don't think you, technically you can really communicate with the V8 garbage collector and Node.js. And so what, what maybe happen is they put in another garbage collector on the Node.js layer to uh, deal with strings better. Because uh, the idea was that V8 is meant for the client, and then they put it on the server, so the, the environment is different. So you have different requirements and different performance enhancing uh, op opportunities. Okay, I think that we should probably just move on and get to the next speaker. Thanks, Great. guys. Thanks a lot. <clears throat>